Sound health, that's not just a phrase. These two words actually are intimately related with, with one another. Now, this is not a new idea. Uh, this is Florence Nightingale in 1859. Sadly, it seems that nobody listened to Florence Nightingale then because noise in society has gone on increasing ever since it's become a major issue and a major burden on our healthcare systems. This is the estimate of the World Health Organization on the effect of traffic noise on people in Western Europe. Now, 2% of the population may not sound like a large number until you realize that's actually 8 million people who are having their sleep seriously disturbed by traffic noise on a nightly basis. Think of the impact of that on the healthcare system. As those people become prey to chronic diseases, mental, physical, spiritual, whatever it is, chronic sleep deprivation has major effects. And they probably also have car accidents on the way to work, accidents at home, arguments, violent confrontations. It's an enormous burden on healthcare. And there's now evidence, substantial evidence, that noise is related to heart issues, to cardiovascular issues, high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke. I can't give you a precise percentage increase in the risk. The evidence is not yet quite robust enough, but I think there's a, a big enough body of evidence there for, for us to say there is definitely a causal link. Now, if we get ill in any of those ways, or in any other way, of course, we go away from the noise of society and into a hospital environment where it's beautifully designed, isn't it, for the ears to be optimal for our recovery. Sadly, no, that is not the case. Hospital noise is going up even faster than noise in society, doubled since 1972. Take a look at this graph. This is truly frightening. The blue bars here are the World Health Organization's recommended maximum background noise levels by day and night in a hospital facility. The, the yellow is where we were in 1960. The red is where we were in 2005. Now, that's pretty bad. You would think that's like double, isn't it? Well, it's worse than that. Because decibels are logarithmic. So every 10, 10 decibel increase is roughly equivalent to a doubling of the noise level. That means that a 30 decibel increase, which is what we have at night, is actually more like eight times the recommended level. And 37 decibels, which is where we are at day, is more like 12 times. This is a really serious problem. Now, it wouldn't be such a big thing if noise didn't affect us, but sound does affect us in four powerful ways. And just to revisit that very first TED talk that I gave, I want to run through those for you very quickly, but with a medical perspective. Here's the first way sound affects us. Sorry about that, a little shot of cortisol, your fight-flight hormone. I don't have to tell this audience about the effect of sudden sound on the system. Sound affects our heart rate, our breathing, our hormone secretions, even our brain waves. It can work against us, creating stress. It can also work for us. If I were to leave this sound on for any length of time, uh, this is surf, you would start to feel pretty drowsy. If you have insomnia, surf is a very good sound to use, 12 cycles a minute very similar to the breathing of a sleeping human being, and a sound we associate with being relaxed. Now, talking of sleep, that is the major way in which sound plays out physiologically in hospitals. We need to sleep in order to recover. And who can sleep in, in an environment that sounds like this? These are warning sounds. You know, our ears are working even while we sleep, and hearing is our primary warning sense. And while we're trying to sleep, our ears are telling us we're in danger from these kind of alarm sounds around us, often located around the head of the patient, of course. Second way sound affects us, psychologically. This piece of music is not going to make you feel happy. It wasn't designed to make you feel happy. Music is a very good conveyor of emotion, happy emotion, sad emotion. It's not the only sound that changes our emotions, though. At my company, The Sound Agency, we often deploy birdsong in commercial settings. We've learned that over hundreds of thousands of years that when the birds are singing, we're pretty safe. So birdsong makes most people feel secure. Also alert, because it's nature's alarm clock. If the birds suddenly stop, that's not a good feeling, is it? That normally means that something bad is about to happen. Now, with sound affecting our emotions, it's no surprise that this result is what happens when we have bad sound in hospitals. Noise is the number one complaint from, from patients in hospitals in America. This was uh, the Beryl Institute in 2013, and the, exactly the same picture in 2011. It's consistently the biggest complaint. Now, I'm a Brit, I don't understand your healthcare system, but I do understand that with the Affordable Healthcare Act, this is gonna start costing money, am I wrong? So that's something that seriously needs to be looked at in the future as well. Third way sound affects us is cognitive. 
You can't understand two people this talking at the same time, time or in this case, one person talking to the twice. Other one. Not possible. Even a woman can't understand two people talking at the same time. <laughs> It's true, we have bandwidth for about 1.6 human conversations. So the research in offices has shown that if you work in an environment like this, it can degrade your productivity by as much as two thirds. Especially if you can hear one person talking, it's taking cognitive bandwidth away from the task at hand. Now, no reason to assume that hospitals are any different from any other work environment. I would expect this to play out in the form of productivity reductions, Impaired communication, if you can't hear what people are saying, then that's going to lead to errors, isn't it? And there is evidence that prescribing errors go up in noisy situations. In hospitals, that's going to cost a lot of money through lawsuits and so forth. Should also mention privacy. Many hospitals haven't thought about doors and walls which actually are fit for purpose. So private conversations with patients become public conversations, and that's not good for anybody. The final way that sound affects us is behavioural. We would love for every medical interaction in the hospital to be like this, all smiley and friendly and calm. But given the noise levels in hospitals, you're far more likely to deal with somebody who feels like this, even if they don't look like it. Noise in offices, again, has been shown to increase stress, increase aggression, reduce helpfulness, increase irritability. Those are not good for customer service. And again, there's a financial impact of that in the future. Why is this happening? Well, partly because hospitals are designed in this way. The acoustics in most hospitals are poor. If I were to clap my hands in this corridor, it would sound like this. And with that level of reverb, any noise in there is going to rattle around and become worse. Plus, we have lots of noise sources in hospitals. We have alarms, we have beeping pages, we have the hissing of systems, we have telephones ringing, we have people talking, we have trolleys moving around. It all adds up to a cacophony of noise. Now, this is not difficult to solve. I want to give you a simple one, two, three to solve this. It's not expensive, and I honestly believe if we do these three things, we can transform healthcare outcomes. Let's look at acoustics first. It's not too difficult. Get an acoustician involved. If you're designing a healthcare facility, get them in at the beginning. If you have a, an existing facility, you can retrofit lots of these things. The percentages in this little chart are the amount of sound that these things can soak up. If, the, if you use acoustic surfaces. Even a carpet can soak up 40% of the sound that hits it. So take a look at evidence-based design. Have you come across that? There's a great body of evidence now about the way in which the environment of a healthcare facility affects the outcomes. Use zones. Not every part of a hospital has to be clean, sterile, hard. Rooms where you interact with customers, with patients for conversations can be much softer than that and get these acoustic treatments in. Let's take a look at noise. We can switch a lot of these systems off. Have phones on vibrate instead of ring. Have pages that vibrate. We've all heard of alarm fatigue, where many of these alarms are going off and people aren't even paying attention to them. Switch them off. Control your mechanical and electrical noise. Use silent rubberized trolleys. Supply your staff with silent footwear. These are simple things, but they make a massive difference instead of clacky heels in a very hard corridor. Most important of all, train the staff. I think that's probably the single most important thing. If your staff are sensitive to noise and its effects, then they can start to take measures themselves. Once we've controlled the acoustics and reduced the noise, we can start to think about positive sound. We can mask conversations to improve privacy, and we can also mask background noise, whatever's left, to improve sleep. Now, this on its own, I think, can be a huge benefit. And we can reduce stress in stressful places. Let me tell you what I, let me explain what I mean by masking. Uh, I'm going to play you a sound and you'll see the waveform as it goes through. Here it comes. So you're seeing that sound as well as hearing it. Now we can mask that. Typically they'll use pink noise to do that. Pink noise looks like this. And it sounds like this. So you can't hear the background noise anymore over the top of that. Now, I'm not a great fan of pink noise. I think it's rather artificial, and it takes, I think, uh, it, it creates fatigue to ignore it over long periods of time. I would rather use something more organic and natural. Uh, for example, we can use natural sound with some musical elements, which would sound more like this. Now, you can't necessarily mask all the background sound, but if you deliver that kind of sound to patients in bed trying to sleep through soft headphones they can sleep in, that on its own will transform healthcare outcomes and allow them to sleep through the background noise. 
We can also reduce stress levels in interview rooms or where people are waiting for procedures with sound like this. This sounds like a spa and it's not an accident. Spas know how to relax us. And of course, if we put sound into these rooms, it will have an effect. And the research shows that it can reduce the amount of stress hormones people are experiencing dramatically. You can use music for that. It can be expensive and it can be repetitive. We prefer generative sound. Generative sound is produced by a computer. It's algorithmic, it's probabilistic, it does not repeat. It's like a river going past, looks the same, but is always slightly different. It's also a lot cheaper than music. Well, that's a, a great outcome for those spaces. So a simple one, two, three, acoustics, noise, positive sound. If any one of the outcomes on this slide were available by controlling sound and improving sound in healthcare facilities, I think it would be worth exploring this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that all of those outcomes are available to us. They're within grasp. This is not expensive, it's not difficult, and it will transform all of these outcomes overnight almost, if we, take, if we pay attention to this. So here are some actions I'd like to suggest that you undertake. First of all, more research is needed. Research scientific papers on these effects and how they play out in healthcare facilities, but also you guys go out and find out more about this. Just explore the topic. Uh, there's a very good primer by the Center for Health Design, uh, which I recommend that you have a look at, lots of references in there. And actually, there is a set of guidelines which has been produced by some very august acoustical bodies. You should all have a copy of this if you're running a healthcare facility. It tells you exactly what you should be doing. If any of you want to research this with sound, I would be delighted to work with you and provide you free of charge with sound to explore these things. I would love to test these things in healthcare facilities and show how impactful this can be. Go audit your own places. Now, the easiest way to do this is to put an, uh, a blind on, you know, an eye mask on, and have somebody walk you around with their hands on, their, on your shoulders and just listen. A lot of this is not difficult. It's common sense, a great deal of this. And just ask yourself, as you listen to the acoustics, the noise sources, the sound system, the content, whatever's going on there, is this doing people good, or is it working the other way? Design your facilities with sound in mind. Design for the ears as well as for the eyes, and you will get a much better outcome. And most of all, train your staff. Sensitize them so that they don't go around. Even the clicking of a ring binder being closed at the end of a bed at 3 in the morning can rip somebody out of REM sleep. Just thoughtless actions like that have such a huge impact. If we want seriously to produce sound health as an outcome from our healthcare systems, ladies and gentlemen, I really believe it's time that we start paying attention to creating healthy sound in those places. Thank you.